Thank you, everyone, for having us here. I hope you're enjoying the summit as much as I do and as much as we do. Um, today, we have uh, a very diverse panel, uh, and I thank all the panelists for, <coughs> for joining us today. Um, I guess we will start by a little round of introduction, given the diversity of the panel. Uh, so let's start with the other end of the stage. Uh, if you want to introduce yourself, Adriana. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Adriana Gro. I'm the co-founder of the Sovereign Tech Fund in Germany. Um, is that enough, or should I give my little speech so, now? No, let's so do. So, can you talk a little bit about the organization you're representing today, oh, okay. and also what is your uh, expertise in the domain or your interest in the open source security? Okay, here comes my little speech. Um, I think I'm uh, maybe a little bit the odd one out. Uh, my background is not in tech or security, um, although I'm, I'm running a, a tech fund. Uh, my background is in public policy and governance. So um, I started from the question, who gets to decide the future and how do we shape it? Um, and that led me to uh, open source software. Um, I think in this audience, people may be able to trace my line of thinking from that end to this end. Uh, in other cases, I need to explain it. But of course, and also listening to uh, what Thomas just said, um, how we develop, design, and use technology has a massive impact on uh, our future, our economy, our society. And with the Sovereign Tech Fund, we want to give a digital update, I'd say, to how we think about the foundations of how our society works. Um, we want to invest in open digital-based technologies with the Sovereign Tech Fund, that means digital infrastructures, um, protocols, libraries, standards, software that developers use to develop software. Um, because that's what innovation, services, products, also what we can do as uh, administration or as society relies on. And it's not in the best shape. Um, right now, it's communities that take care of it mostly. It's some companies investing. Um, and we believe that it's also a job where we should invest public money in the public's interest uh, to make sure it works. Thank you. <laughs> um, so much for now, I'd say. Over to you, Sven. Thank you, Adriana. Sven? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm Sven Herpig. I'm running the Cybersecurity Policy and Resilience Program at the German tech policy think tank Stiftung Neue Verantwortung. And um, I, I really hope I don't waste your time. I'm super new to the field of open source, um, so bear with me and call me out if something's wrong that I'm saying. Um, we're coming from especially cybersecurity policy background and even more niche from what is the government's role in that. And in that regard, we just launched last year a project, which is hopefully why I'm here, um, to figure out better um, what, if any, could be the government's role in fostering IT security of open source software. And even more detailed, if you want, uh, we're looking at creating a blueprint. And the blueprints were mentioned earlier in one of the panels for, for national governments, um, European government um, and, and others, of how you can design an open source program office, which is one um, government-led, government-coordinated, whatever, and more focused on IT security. So of course, we want to look at the OSPO model that has been established. And we want to dig down on how that can look like if we get it more to the operational level and more to the security level, and how we can integrate it verti vertically and horizontally into the um, architecture, cybersecurity architecture of the different governments, and how it can support policy interventions and how it can help make regulation and policies less bad and more understanding of the open source ecosystem and how it is married to the cybersecurity ecosystem. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Georg Kunz. I'm working in the open source program office of Ericsson. And um, my colleagues and I, therefore, are responsible for setting the policies and strategies uh, that like in terms of how we work with open source software and how we act in the open source ecosystem. Um, I'm, however, a developer 
my background. So I've been um, active in various open source initiatives and forums and projects over the last 10 years. Um, and very recently, I focused uh, more on the security aspects, following the OpenSSF for Linux Foundation projects, focusing specifically on securing the open source ecosystem. And uh, obviously, my interest here in, in this conversation is that, well, like from an, from an Ericsson perspective, obviously, our products are built to build or end up in critical infrastructure as such securities has always been of, uh, let's say, great importance to us. And um, from that perspective, I, as a developer and as an Ericsson representative, uh, very much welcome the initiatives that we see here, at least the intentions of uh, really now putting money and uh, things into practice to improve open source security. Um, in terms of regulation, of course, I'm really happy to be part of the conversations because I think there's some quirks that still need to be sorted out, but it's good to have those conversations, and I'm really looking forward to this panel and uh, talking to you later on. Thank you, Jörg. So I'm Stefano Zaccheroli. I go by Zach. Uh, by day, I'm a professor of computer science at the Polytechnic Institute of Paris, and I teach and do research in cybersecurity and um, uh, software engineering. By night, I do not fight crime, but I'm a developer, I'm a geek. I've been a Debian developer for 15 years. I've been involved in the uh, open source initiative. And more relevant for, for this panel today, I'm co-founder and CTO of the Software Heritage Project. And what we do at Software Heritage is that we are a non-profit initiative in which what we try to do is to collect archive for future generations and make it available for everyone, all the source code we can find. We have already archived more than 200 million uh, projects and uh, everyone can actually navigate and find their projects that have disappeared from their uh, original hosting site, retrieve them and analyze them in the, for, for their reasons. My interest for our conversation today is that I think there is an important discussion to be had about where information about vulnerabilities of open source software are located, where they are stored, and what can we do to make them more easily accessible for everyone that actually wants to build services to improve the security of all the software that exists in the market. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Rumble. I'm the CEO of the Rust Foundation. Um, so I'm, I'm here because Rust is very sexy right now. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, it, it's playing a really big part in a lot of the security conversations that are, that are coming up now. Um, I'm really interested to, to hear what other people have to say. Um, and I'm also here to advocate for the role of foundations um, in, in trying to find good security solutions for, for the common good. Um, I think it's really, really important to have lots of stakeholders in this conversation, and I think that foundations have a crucial role. Um, so yeah, I'm obviously going to be advocating very strongly for that. Um, but it's really nice actually to hear that there are other people here that, that are new to the space. I came in this morning, this is my first time at this, uh, at this conference, um, and it's really nice to see that it's the first time for other people as well. Um, there's, there's new faces here, um, so it's nice not to be the only one. Um, and I, I think it's great that open source is influence and it's, um, its prominence in the policy world now is getting so much attention. So this is really exciting for me. Thank you. So I guess I'll say a word about me. Um, I'm uh, head of security at the Eclipse Foundation. So the Eclipse Foundation is a, a European open source software foundation. Um, our vision is to be um, the, the best in class in implementing the best practices in um, supply chain security, open source software supply chain security. We, um, we actually help our project improve the security posture of their supply chain. And that's how I came in here to, to talk about the, all the best practices. Um, so before talking about that, um, we, we are talking about open source security, but how exactly does, oh, does it actually differ from standard or regular software security? Or is it anything special or can it be treated just like regular software? So maybe Zach, you want to answer that? 
So th that's actually a very good question because it's kind of polluting the discussion about the security of, of open source software. So we need to avoid being falling in the trap of it is an open source specific problem. So software security is a problem for all the software which is out there, and we're in a society where there is more and more software everywhere in our lives. The reason why we are talking about specifically the security of open source software is that is because there is so much of it in all the devices. So there are a number of studies that have shown that essentially every single IT product on the market, be it pure software or mixed software and hardware, contains some bits and pieces of open source software. So naturally, given there is so much of this software out there, people are talking about its security. But if anything, given if all other parameters are, are the same, open source software is actually more secure than the equivalent proprietary software thanks to its inspectability. So people can analyze it and, uh, and actually find security issues that help developers fix them. So this is actually a good feature of open source software. The other good feature of open source software is that its license terms allows everyone to freely copy, reuse, and integrate them in, in your product provided you respect licensing terms, of course, and that makes it possible to reuse at a very, very large scale open source software. Hence, basically, free and open source software is winning, and the price to pay for this victory to some extent is that we need to you know, worry more about the security of the software we are developing than we were used to do when open source software was entirely niche in the market. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, Rebecca, do you want to sure. add to that? Yeah, I, I think trying to make a distinction is is kind of irrelevant. You know, the security in software is security in software. Um, and, and as everyone has kind of said here today, you know, even commercial products are built up of, of various bits of, uh, of open source. So it's really, you know, the, the key is how can we kind of bake these things in in the development stage for open source uh, developers and maintainers rather than try and kind of bolt security on at a later date. Um, it, that has very much been the case historically. You know, security hasn't really been baked into learning um, in computer science courses. Um, it's not really been seen as part, like a natural part of the process or part of the process that's kind of automated so it's easy. Um, so we end up with, you know, uh, components or products that are built of all these di different things and then someone tries to bolt on security at the end, um, which is, you know, it, it doesn't really work very well. Um, so we need a new way of approaching it and distracting ourselves by trying to define whether it's different or not. I think it's, yeah, it's just a distraction. <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely an industry-wide issue. So then if security of open source software is not very different from security of software, non-open source software, um, why is there such a uh, discussion around the regulations that are coming that doesn't treat open source software in a specific way if the security of open source is not different. Um, and so then what, what are the risks actually uh, for open source if we treat open source the same way as non-open source software? Maybe you're, you want to talk about it? Yeah. Um, I'd like to first mention one more aspect to, the, uh, to add on to the, to the prior discussion, one more very interesting point that kind of again is in line with showing that there's not much of a difference. What we want to have between open source and non-open source software, what we want to have at the end of the day are secure systems, right? And of course that starts with developing the software that will end up in those systems, but there are additional aspects that many of those of, of you who are involved in the security uh, domain or, or community are aware of, and that's like, how do you operate a system? How do you configure a system, right? This, this comes on top and it's completely irrespective of whether or not the software is open or closed. Um, and this, I think, is also where regulation, or this needs to be taken into account by regulation as well, that it's more than just has the software been built in a certain fashion or does, it, does this artifact um, fulfill a certain quality mark? It's like, how is it used? How does it integrate into a bigger, into a bigger picture? Um, but then, of course, um, as you asked, the, um, why is open source so, well, so much in, in focus right now? Um, well, I, I guess it's part of the reasons that, like, uh, one and a half years ago, we've seen 
one very famous example of open source software uh, vulnerability in there, which kind of again goes back to what I just said, it's somewhere between a configuration issue and the design flaw caused uh, a lot of headache in the community. And um, out of that, I think the very good initiatives that were the good intentions that we see kind of started to emerge that we want to now focus on open source software and securing it. And the openness of open source software provides the, um, not just the benefit of being able to inspect it, but I think it also comes with, the, or creates the responsibility for everybody using it that one can proactively or should proactively work with the open source community to improve that, um, th their security posture. And this again is one of those specific properties of, of open source software that makes it so, so great because it can also uh, spread the load now again across the industry to kind of work on improving this common good that open source software has become. Thank you. Uh, Sven, maybe as um, a newcomer to the open source um, ecosystem, so you may have a comment about that. How, how can policy improve the security of open source software? How does it differ from um, regular cyber security? Yeah, I think, I think it has to find its role in the sense that um, we have seen regulation and not only like legislation but also policies in general um, which are targeting or taking into account the tech sector, um, especially if it pertains to cyber security, which are just uh, plainly bad. And, and um, I don't believe that most of them are designed that way because of lobbyist efforts and they are just accidentally bad because those that make the laws do not have an intrinsic knowledge of what they are regulating because it's a complex issue, right? Um, and then what, what we end up with is something like, um, in this specific term now, the Cyber Resilience Act, and Martin um, mentioned that earlier, and I think also the Eclipse put out a statement on that, why that's a problem. Um, so we have two complex fields, cybersecurity, where we often get it wrong in the first instance uh, when we look at policies and regulations, and then we, we bring that together with the open source ecosystem, which is also extremely complex as far as I understand it right now. And if we bring them together, there's a huge room for making mistakes if you want to regulate it. So it looks very heavy-handed sometimes, but it might just be accidents because those that are designing it and those they are consulting, they don't understand the complexity and what it actually means. So we, we have to, um, or we have to inform policymakers better uh, and they have to take our advice on how to design the regulation and they have to better understand the ecosystem. That's why I'm coming back uh, to the point of, of the open source program offices because if, if I have that, then I should go there. I should ask, is that what I'm doing for the specific thing that you're doing, which is open source, good, bad or not, and how can we change it? And I shouldn't go there and say, is it good, bad? They say, oh, it's not great, and then I go away and keep it that way anyway, right? I mean, then I don't need that. Um, so I have to be open to heed the advice, but first I have to create that point where I can go and can ask, okay, guys, well, you're not, you're not lobbying for anything. You're just there to tell us if that's going to be really bad because we want to we have more security and we all agree on that, but we don't want to stifle innovation. And so we, we have to figure out something that works. We cannot say, well, it's open source, so there's no regulation touching it. We, you know, we want to make it more secure, but not with regulation or policy. They should just do what they're doing and we hope it gets better. Um, but at the end of the day, we also don't want to just over-regulate it and then we don't have innovation anymore. The people who are doing it are afraid that they get, get sued in the court of law and they, they're like, okay, we're not going to provide stuff to the European Union anymore. It's too complicated. The regulation is stupid. So, so we have to find a sweet spot there. And that starts with creating awareness not only, but also having expertise and, and understanding somehow the complexity of these fields. That's great. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about regulation, so actually um, in Europe we're also talking about digital sovereignty and the, the will of the European Union to, to reach digital sovereignty. Would improving the security of open source software a way to gain the uh, digital sovereignty? So maybe Adriana with the sovereign tech fund, <laughs> you may have a say about that? Uh, yes, I have so many thoughts uh, coming from your discussion. Um, but uh, let me focus on this point first because it's uh, really important for, for us uh, to 
explain a little how we understand digital sovereignty. On one of the earlier panels, we also heard if uh, that framework of uh, digital sovereignty means um, putting up a border, a digital border around Europe, then that's not what we mean, um, and also not what we want. Uh, the term is, I think, disputed, uh, especially also in the US. Uh, when we talk to partners in the US and we say digital sovereignty, they're like, ooh. Um, and then we say, actually, it's about choice. And it's not about saying those are the bad ones and those are the good ones. It's about making sure that everyone is in a position where you can act. And that means you need to make sure that you have no strong single dependency where whoever it is, a single actor could just decide for you and you have no say. And this is why we want to invest in an open source ecosystem, in community, in many actors, so you have a vibrant um, ecosystem where everyone can make choices, uh, you, you have uh, innovation, but you also have security. So it's about individual choice, for us, first and foremost, but of course it's also about choices for companies and governments um, to extend it to that level as well. But it's not about us against them, it's not about protectionism, and it's not about putting up borders in the internet, no. Um, and if we understand um, digital sovereignty as strengthening the foundation in open source, then I think this is also a push for security. And I guess this is also why uh, I'm on this panel here, because if we talk about regulation and policies um, and about how open source is more secure than proprietary software, we talk about theory, because in the end it always comes down to the people, right? Uh, and we need to put the people in a place where they can act so we need the maintainers, uh, the security researchers, we need people finding uh, security flaws, we need people fixing them, um, we need people who have c um, capabilities to learn, to exchange, and for this I think it's crucial that we understand that uh, we need more support, also sustainability in the field. And um, coming back to what I said in the beginning, I think this should not just be up to private money and to the free time of people doing it out of passion. This should also be something that we understand as a public's job to make sure it's there, because we all rely on it. Um, and I think it's a really good idea to invest some public money um, into this. And not just money, we, we need the money to incentivize developments, you know, more diversity in the field, more new people coming in, more open source strategies between private actors and communities that are on eye level, more capacity building on the administration side. Um, all of this has nothing to do with just giving money somebody. All of this is structural change, but we can fund structural change, or we try to. It's not easy, but we're learning. So, um, yeah, that would be my take on your question. Thank you. Um, what would be the, the role of foundations probably in this digital sovereignty environment? Would the Rust Foundation provide, what would the Rust Foundation provide in such an environment and for such a goal? So, I'm in complete agreement with, with pretty much everything you said there. Um, and I think, you know, plurality is one of our biggest strengths in open source. You know, the, the sheer number of choice, the sheer availability of, of different views, different perspectives, different experiences, um, and different sources of funding. You know, ha having a patchwork um, of support makes makes our software much stronger. You know, proprietary software tends to be quite brittle in a way because it is only narrowly supported. Um, in terms of what foundations can do. You know, I'm, I, I have been frustrated in the past by governments, not just in, in tech, but in, in terms of all kinds of policy areas. There is a, a tendency that, oh, we can leave it to the market to solve this problem, or we'll, we'll just leave the market to its own devices and they will, you know, everything will be fine. Um, this always leads to gaps, whether you're looking at countries where healthcare is privatized or education or, or all sorts of things. Uh, you end up with huge gaps um, that people and, and services fall between, uh, and you have nonprofits or volunteers picking up the slack. 
we simply cannot afford to allow corporations in tech to, to monopolize security and uh, our approach to, to securing the digital world. They have an enormous, enormously important part to play, and we're very lucky at the Breast Foundation to have the support of a lot of, of, of big tech organizations. Um, but we can't leave it to them to decide, okay, don't worry guys, we'll, we'll take care of the security over here, and that company will take care of security over there. And between us, it'll, it'll probably be okay. That, that's not okay. We don't know what's going on inside of those organizations because security is a notoriously secure subject. <laughs> um, disclosures are, are difficult even amongst trust, trusted people. Um, so you, know, you need foundations, you need nonprofit actors, neutral actors who don't have shareholders to answer to, to, to be able to say, do you know what, for the common good, we're gonna invest in this. These, these are initiatives that will help secure things better. Investing in education and good security awareness in, in computer science courses, the, these are things that are gonna help. Um, so yeah, I think where foundations come in, where companies can't and where govern, governments can't, is actually being able to say, look, we work with the maintainers. We have the maintainers on our board of directors. We work with them every day. We know exactly where the pain points are. And actually, we can direct that funding in a way that is not going to result in profit for one company or, or a distortion of the market in some way. We're here to make sure that, that the ecosystem is a good, safe, secure, and fun place for, for everyone that wants to be involved. Thank you. Um, so securing the open source is also securing the access of the source code to the source code because it's the main data behind uh, open source. Um, so how, how do you, what do you propose with the, the software heritage project? So, um, I think we are all aligned on the fact that digital sovereignty is not about borders, and that's a very good point. I mean, I'm glad to hear that we are in, in alignment, but it also means not being false in the way we approach the, uh, the, the security of the uh, open source supply chain. And so when it comes to what can we do to secure an independent access to information that are relevant for the uh, open source supply chain, there are a couple of elements that they want to, to raise here. So there are two types of data which are essentially needed and useful for improving the state of open source security. The basic kind of data, the first kind of data, is indeed source code. So we need to have access to the source code. Actually, quite a number of vulnerabilities in the open source supply chain uh, in the past were related to the lack of availability of access to specific uh, components. So components that used to be available on some package manager repository disappeared. And that actually ended up breaking builds for a lot of people around the world. So as it happens, if you look at, the, let's say, the geopolitical angle of modern software development platforms, you will notice that a lot of those platforms are operated by actors which are not located in Europe. If you think of the, uh, the, uh, the main player in uh, collaborative software development is located in the US, you have other players located uh, in Australia, and also a lot of the package manager repository are actually operated by for-profit companies which are not European companies. So it's fine, they are for now offering their services to everyone in the world, and they're giving access to European entities to those data, but it's better to cover our bases. So essentially, the first things in terms of digital sovereignty about access to open source code is making sure we have an independent access to that source code if something happens and for whatever reason, uh, we can leave, lose access to that information in the future. So on this specific point, we as Software Heritage are archiving all the source code we can find essentially everywhere in the world. And we are a European-based initiative. So the, the main copy of the archive is in France, but we have a number of mirrors that are being populated in other member states in Europe. So that's the first answer. And of course, these are just copies that are located in Europe. They are not copies only for Europeans. So they are open for everyone in the world, but they are in Europe. So as a first line of service, they're available to every uh, European citizen or, or entity. So that's the first type of data, guaranteeing access to the source code itself, which is needed to build products or also to analyze them to find and to fix vulnerabilities. The, se the second type of data, which, which matters a lot for uh, improving the, the security of open source software, is access to vulnerability information. So the CVE databases, all the uh, databases out there that offers information like this specific version of an open source component is known or has been reported to be affected by this vulnerability. This other version, later on, fixes the issue. 
So this information is available open data right now, but again, is for the most part curated and distributed and made available by entities which are not European entities. So I think that the, one of the next priorities, strategic priorities for uh, EU in this respect is making sure that this information is replicated, is copied, and cross-referenced with all we know about open source software. So, of course, I think it's something where uh, software editors can play a role, but more generally, we need to think as a, uh, at an independent access to vulnerability information about all the pieces of open source code that are out there. Thank you, Zach. So, yeah, um, we think about the, the data, the, the source code, and the, the, the NVD data databases and so on, but w what we see also, for instance, from the Eclipse Foundation point of view is that digital signature is taking more and more importance in the, the securi securization in securing the supply chain uh, of software. And um, we see some projects, uh, some initiative about providing uh, digital signature services online that, that, uh, that are as, as easy as, um, to use as Let's, let's Encrypt, for instance, to, to get uh, uh, web certificate um, very, very easily. But it's all run and uh, operated by non-European companies. So probably having a similar infrastructure in Europe would be a way to uh, gain a bit more of sovereignty. Um, so great, thank, thank you. Um, my next question would be a, a bit more like, like a closing uh, question is, what would be the next step so for all the, um, the, the, the stakeholders? So what, what would be the next step for the, the, the EU parliament, our EU government, the, the, the communities and the open source communities and also the industries? Do you have um, a view on that? Uh, of course, uh, and for me it's um, that we understand digital infrastructure like roads and bridges uh, to be part of our uh, digital common good that we need to sustain as uh, the public. And so we have something like the Sovereign Tech Fund but bigger and better at European level and we make sure that uh, our digital open ecosystem stays open, secure, accessible, participatory, as a foundation for our democracy and uh, companies as well. Sven, any, what's the big next step for the industry, for the, the communities? Well, I, I, think, I stick with my talking points about the government's role in it and um, be it the, the European government that has already created an OSPO or the national government that started doing it, um, we, need, we need a point in, in the governments that, that have both understanding of open source ecosystem and cybersecurity, and um, both or all parties need to know that this point exists and how to approach it. Uh, two, two sides to that. If I'm a government agency planning some regulation or just some policy maybe, I should know that I go to that place and I listen to these people because they know what to do, right? And then I take it back and then I include it. And on the other point, if I'm, for example, a security researcher and I find um, a bug uh, in an open source software and I don't want to track down who is the maintainer or who I can talk to, I should maybe also have the option um, of having a, a government contact point where if I, if I just don't want to keep it to myself and I don't have time to figure it out, I just drop the, the bug there and I know that they take care of it, that it gets put in a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process and whoever is responsible will get the information and can actually fix it. So this, this single point of contact for improving security in open source software must exist and we must be aware of it and it must be a very, very low threshold to contact that um, single point of contact because otherwise it's not, just, it's not good to just have it it needs to be approachable and we need to be aware of it. And I think that's, that's where we need to go, at least from, from the government's perspective. I think that's where we need to go. And um, as an offer to the entire audience, I'm, I'm really super open to why I came here, to get your ideas on it, what kind of, what kind of function it should be, what policy interventions it can do, and, and uh, what you see the government actually, the national government, the European Power government actually doing in, in that term. And you can also tell me you don't see a role for them. That's also fine with me. Um, but that's why I'm here for. Thank you. Jörg? Yes, I, I very much agree with what uh, Swen just said. Um, point number one, really, in order to create regulation that has the, the right impact, um, it's important to understand the, the, the workings of, of open source, of the workings of security. 
Um, so, yes, I, I would also recommend exactly the same, starting and facilitating these conversations with uh, the industry, with but also the, the development community. Um, then, in terms of regulation, another thing, I would honestly, like really wearing my, my developers, open source developers hat, I would really like to see that, as was stated in the previous keynote, that we'll find a good definition that removes the open source ecosystem as such as much as possible from any regulatory burdens. And instead, put it on the, on the companies, right? That, that's where it belongs as a representative of one commercial entity here. I'd say, yeah, well, we'll take responsibility for the products anyway. So this is what should be regulated in combination with creating the incentives, again, for the commercial players to, again, go out there and try to improve the baseline security of the open source ecosystem, that those two things need to play together. But I'm a little bit concerned that uh, putting too much burden on the communities will stifle innovation. We've mentioned all of that. It will, I think, have a detrimental effect, and this is not where we really want to go. Let's, let's take the right organizations, take care of the responsibility. Um, then the, um, yes, as I already mentioned, it, organizations should step up their game in terms of investing in, in the sustainability of the open source ecosystem or try to understand how they be, can become a more valuable member so that sustainability is not as the sustainability of the open source ecosystem isn't as strained as it currently is. We, we already know that there is issues. There are issues like maintainer burnout that, that is really a thing. So um, it cannot be that either regulation or commercial organizations take this push towards security and kind of translate that into more requirements on the developers. So again, that needs to come from the industry as well. And I think this is not just added cost. From a European market perspective, learning how to become a um, proactive, or not proactive, a collaborative and value-adding member of the overall open source software ecosystem, um, well, you gain competence. You know how to work with these things. It makes it easier for you, for your R&D organizations, to maintain the software that you're your building, right? Um, so there, there are benefits there as well. And I think that needs to be realized across the, the EU market. And I think then we, have, we are on a good track. Thank you. Uh, Dijk, so what would be the big, big next step for the industry? Yeah, so I want to propose this thought experiment to, to people in the, in the audience. So try to imagine if you're a developer in your day-to-day you know, -day job, if you're not a developer, talk to developers that work with you or, or for you. And try to imagine, go through your day, and every time you use a service, so something which is not running on your computer, try to check where that service is located, who is operating that, and what is their business model. And then try to imagine, imagine a world in which not necessarily all of that is European and completely open in its data, in its software, but where at least you have an option to choose something else, which is not that specific service, but is another service co implemented completely with open source software, uh, operating only on open data, and ask yourself and ask your peers what it will take for us, for the open source community, to get from where we are right now to that place in which, in where you have those options. And I think that's the, the kind of mindset we need to have for you know, the next 10 years to, to improve the current state of affairs. And back to your point, if we do that as a side effect, we will indeed increase the, you know, the, the community in Europe and the, uh, the business in Europe that works in, uh, in this kind of, uh, on these kind of topics. That's just my uh, concluding remark and proposal for an exercise for all of us. Thanks for the exercise. <laughs> Rebecca, any? Um, it's like the creeping death. I'm the last one, so I've got to think of something original to say. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm probably going to say similar things to, to everyone else. I want, I want two things specifically. I want harmonization of regulation. You know, it, uh, open source is global. Um, and I cannot 
be dealing <laughs> with US regulations that say one thing and EU regulations that say another thing and UK regulations that say another thing and that's only just you know three areas we're not even going into to, to Asia um, so we really need at least some harmonization even if everyone's kind of going in the same direction and it's on the same scale that's okay but what we really really can't deal with is different you know, different territories going off in different directions. It'll be utterly wretched for everyone, and it will totally stifle innovation. Linked to that, what I really, really want to see, and what I'm really looking forward to, to the, one of the later panels, is sustainable funding for this work to be done. I'm fine with regulation. I think regulation is a great prompt to make people think about things meaningfully, and I think we should be, be doing that. But you've got to pay for it. You know, <laughs> open source has been done for free for, for too long anyway. Um, the, the burden needs to, to fall on companies, on, on people who benefit to, to actually pay for this work because it's not going to do itself. Um, and if you want good, safe, secure uh, products, then, you know, put your hand in your pocket and, and make sure that those things are funded sustainably, not, oh, here's some money for like 12 months. Um, you know, great, we've solved security in 12 months. That, that's fine then. No, it, it needs to be an ongoing thing. Security has to keep happening. We need to keep doing it properly. It needs to be properly funded and it needs to be baked into the regulations. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I would, I agree with everything. Um, what, what I would add is uh, do not put the burden of security on the shoulders of developers. Um, it's definitely not something that they, they, they have time or they, they, they want to do. Uh, we need to sustainize open source to be able to have services and uh, be able to help developers um, think about security and uh, do security, but without taking too much of their time. Thank you very much to all the panelists today. And uh, I'll leave you with Paula for the rest of the day. Thank you very much.